Working Cows Podcast, Episode 164. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Hi everybody, it's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows Podcast, powered by the Global Egg Network, here with another episode for you guys. Really excited to be joined today by Annalise Walker. She is one of the minds behind Walker Farms and is in the process of starting a new course that she's putting on to help people take an ecosystems approach to their marketing of their products. And so... Uh, very timely with uh, kind of some disruptions in the food supply chain and how we are dealing with those different things and giving people the tools they need to take some responsibility for some of those things. So they've been doing this um, direct marketing thing there at Walker Farms for quite a while and so uh, very much qualified to talk about these issues. So it's really good to have Annalisa here with us today. So Annalisa, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Clay. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, and I'm I'm really excited about what you've got going on. Uh, you're joining me to, to, today to talk about uh, a new uh, online marketing uh, course that you're putting together for uh, farmers and ranchers to build a better uh, connection with their with their end consumer. Is that would that be an accurate assessment of what you're shooting to accomplish? Yeah, for sure. So through through my work as a as a small regenerative farmer here in central Minnesota, and then also my involvement, not only with my work at, as a support tech for my grazing, but also through the Minnesota Farmers Union, I, I've been in touch with a lot of uh, different farmers in different contexts across the United States and in other countries. And one thing that I've really noticed is that farmers have a hard time telling their story. Um, I think part of it is you know, gaining confidence around um, what their story is, what does that mean for them, and then how do they tell it effectively to their audiences or to their communities in a way that's palatable and, and you know, still humble and, um, you know, people just don't really like talking about themselves, <laughs> you know, unless you ask them active questions. So um, it's kind of my goal is to help people understand how to use these tools, where do they fit on the internet, how can they leverage them to, to be able to build their businesses and um, really build solid communities that can withstand the test of time. Nice. So some of the, one of the words that came to my mind when you were talking there is uh, the idea of barriers. Uh, what are some of the barriers that currently stand between uh, farmers and ranchers and their end consumer and and what are you hoping to do to help them overcome those barriers? So I think there's two major barriers. One of them um, is definitely trust. Um, so consumer trust overall um, has really decreased, um, especially in the last five years. Um, in some, you know, some surveys have shown as much as half as people surveyed don't believe that brands have their best interest in mind. Um, and, you know, 81% trust or like believe that trust is important and part of their purchasing behavior. So uh, if they don't t- trust a brand or believe that a brand has their best interest at heart, they're just not going to spend money there. Um, you know, especially with um, in recent news, you know, a lot of these farms being called into question um, for animal treatment or it's like uh, humane handling of animals and sort of animal production has really been called into question. And, and so um, my hope is that, you know, and uh, I would say like teaching these people how to be able to effectively tell their story and build that trust and transparency with their audience or with their community and, um, you know, through the use of these digital tools. The other side of that is the actual use of the tools themselves. (laughs) So um, if you feel that you are not um, very technologically adept um, it can be really intimidating building out your own website, starting to build your social media. How do you curate your email marketing? What does the success look like? Um, and then also, you know, there is a very real fear of internet trolls, as it were. I'm air quoting here, right? So 
um, negative comments on your social media posts? How do you handle that? What does that look like? And it can be really, it can be scary. Um, but my goal is to make it a lot more approachable. And, and how do you handle those types of things um, when they do rise? Because they will. So, so the barriers for you, uh, as you understand it, are trust and tools. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Trust yep. and tools. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, how do we, or how, how are you through, through this, um, this mastermind, uh, course, as you've called it, uh, how, how are you seeking to help farmers and ranchers understand how to develop trust? So the biggest thing first is going to be understanding like, um, your operation, right? So building trust first become, or first you need to know your business, why you do what you do, what is your calling? How do you approach the way that you farm a ranch? And being able to effectively tell that story through, you know, story making, what does that process look like? So breaking it down into very um, distinct sections of like understanding your brand, understanding your story, then understanding who am I selling to? What does that look like? And building conversation. And so um, I'll help, you know, people figure out how to create content buckets. And so they have like this long list of ideas that they can sort of pull from when their mojo is just really not jiving. Um, Then we'll get into like the actual tools. So looking at social media, what context does it serve? So um, how do you use it? How do you use different platforms or what platforms are right for your company um, or for your business? And then moving into like your website and your email marketing, um, best practices, again, what context do they serve within the scope of your business um, and how can you leverage them as separate tools? Uh, The last thing is going to be talking about local SEO, so local search engine optimization. So how do you populate in the Google, the Google like megaplex, right? So um, Google owns the search engine world. It's sort of like who we always look at for best practices and how to format things. And and so, um, you know, an interesting thing to cite is that 41% of all searches performed on Google are created with local intent. Mm. So, um, you know, teaching people how to format their website so they are populating um, and so they are showing up when people are interested in their products or could be interested in their products. So looking forward to it. It sounds really good. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. Um I think, you know, it's the course that I wish that was there when I first started. Um I literally I bought I bought social media marketing for dummies when I first started. Um it was, you know, in my blog there's a post about it of like where I started and how I got to where I am and um you know, if you can distill it down and like sort of uh decrease the time at the whipping post. <laughs> you know, it's it's always a good thing. Um you know, and, and so I think, I hope people appreciate it, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Is email, email still a pretty powerful part of what you guys are doing? Definitely. Hmm. Email sell, email sell. Um, yeah, I was reading some research the other day about email marketing in general. Um, that, you know, I think it was like 61% of people will check their email before their feet even hit the ground hmm. in the morning, which, um, to me is wild. Um, although I still, I actually do that. Like I'll wake up, check my emails, make my plan. I'm not a morning person. So I'll like, make my plan before I get out of bed <laughs> so that I'm like prepared. And I think there's a lot of people that are out there. And um, it's also important to note that like your email and your website are really, um, you know, where you have the most control. Um, sure. you don't have any control over how you are populated in, in search engines. You don't really have any control over how you pop you're populated in social media, even if you're doing paid ads. So making sure that your email marketing and your, and your website are solid, solid pinch hitters. Like that is super key to like making sure that people are working their ways down the funnel and actually making that purchase. Hmm. Um, you know, it's that sell and then serve and making sure that you're serving your community and that's where surveys come in. Um, you know, I've read somewhere that the, the price of data actually surpassed the price of oil in the 2016 election. Um, like <laughs> data is the currency of the internet. Um, it's like the carbon. And so if you can sink as much data into your website, that's where you can really start harnessing and harvesting it. Um, and, and really leveraging those relationships 
to make a better profit. Um, you know, mm. so. cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, I guess one of the other, uh, I'm probably going to forget it again. One of the questions that I forgot to ask is how local, um, do you envision your relationships being, uh, do you, on your, uh, on what at Walker's farms, are you guys selling things, uh, more than just at pickup locations? Are you doing any mailing or is it, is it mostly all, uh, kind of person to person? Yeah. So, um, we do offer door to door delivery, contactless delivery, right. Um, to the cooties and stuff, but we do offer shipping to the, <laughs> to the greater Minnesota area. Um, it's not something that we've really pushed. Um, because with the Rona, um, our local following has really, really increased mm-hmm. and we really want to make sure that we're serving those local community members because really, um, it's that community ecosystem that's going to support us through the hard time. So if something was to happen, if like the majority of our, um, you know, business was through shipping and then something happened with shipping, um, mm-hmm you know, that would really disrupt our business. And so making sure that we don't have all of our eggs in one basket and that most of our customers are readily accessible to us is is pretty important. Um, Because we'll be honest, like, I'll be honest, I've lost a little bit of trust in the mailing, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and just making sure that things are getting there on time because, you know, meat is not necessarily something that you want to take a exorbitant amount of time to get to somewhere. So we, we, we serve the greater Minnesota area, but the majority of our focus is the Twin Cities Metro, St. Cloud, and surrounding areas. So. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, meat has got to be one of the more expensive things to ship because you've got weight issues and then you've got timeliness mm-hmm. issues and then you, you've got to add mm-hmm. in all your insulation and cooling and all that stuff, you know, whether it's dry ice or whatever it is mm-hmm. to keep it, to get mm-hmm. it there on time and, and intact. Oh, for sure. And I think it's really important to remember, too, that people are not necessarily buying your product. They're buying the way that your product makes them feel. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, making sure that people understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and and where do they fit within that context? Because everybody wants to be the hero in their own story. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, while our customers are celebrating us and like, hey, you know, you did this thing, you installed a bunch of pig fence and didn't kill your in-laws, like, yes. You know, like, that's a success. Um, but it's also, hey, you know, our customers are really looking for healthy local food that's, you know, raised in a transparent way. And, you know, celebrating our moms and our single dads and our dads and our aunts and grandmas and whoever, you know, making sure that they feel celebrated and making the choices that they're making um, by purchasing with us. Um, that's really important because we can't, we farmers would not exist without our customers. And so making sure that the customer knows that they feel valued and making sure that they feel served and that they're making the right choice for them and for their family. Um, You know, we're not for everyone and there's no way that we can serve everyone. But if we can show up and serve those who that we really value and like who really value us is critical to the success of our business. And what, what you're doing with your course is helping farmers to find a better customer because we've all got customers. It's just some of our customers stink uh, because they're only sharing mm-hmm. with us 18% of that, that food dollar that, that is ending up in the stomach of those of our, of our end consumers. So we're just finding a better customer right. who's willing to pay a little bit more uh, to us. You know, mm-hmm. they, and I don't know how much more they're paying uh, for our products when we are directly marketing it to them over what they would pay in the grocery store. But in, in my mind, and I think in your mind, those those two products really are are maybe related in name only, uh, you know, as far as the story that's behind my mm-hmm. product is a lot more traceable than the story that's behind that product in the grocery store, mm-hmm. cooler, counter, whatever. Right. People will pay more for trust and transparency. Um, now, it's also important to note, so if you are selling into a conventional market and you're raising animals conventionally, um, whoever you're selling to is telling your story. And if they're not adequately representing you, or if they're not serving you, like, would you stay in a relationship with someone who was not willing to give back, who's not willing to support you in your endeavors? Like, I don't know about you. I have a very low patience for BS. And so I would not work well in that world. Um, and so, you know, if you can shift even a portion 
of your enterprises over to a direct to consumer, um, you know, system. I think that's a good thing. That's, you know, putting more control back into farmers and ranchers hands is never a bad thing, Mm -hmm. especially as there's like this greater distance. It it felt perceived greater distance between um, consumers and producers. I think that needs to be remediated. Um, And I think farmers are really well positioned to be able to sort of hand out that olive leaf or that like olive branch of peace and say, Hey, Mm. you know, let's bridge that gap. Let's have those hard conversations. Let's be transparent and, and sort of move forward and, and stop contributing to this, like, you know, chorus of dissension. Right. Mm. So, cause that's when you lose power. Yep. So, uh, have you guys seen, you know, you're talking about building online communities. Have you guys seen community develop between your customers, uh, or are you guys doing anything to facilitate that? You know, I've I've heard of people doing like long table dinners at the farm and different things like that. Uh, have you guys seen that happen or are you doing anything to facilitate it? Yes. Well, we wanted to, um, (laughs) this, this, uh, particular, year uh, really put a hitch in our giddy up when it came to doing on-farm events like we wanted to do a women's series a women's regenerate series so they can Mm -hmm. come and dig their hands into the soil get reconnected to earth and sort of what grounds us as humans you know reconnect to to our sort of ancestral roots um we wanted to do a, a build a longer table event like you talked about where you put like 20 tables together in a really long line and share a meal with your your supporters um this year we've mostly been focusing on social media and social distancing and we do have some people in our family who are um at risk and so you know being able to facilitate conversations using social media marketing email marketing using our website and then video to to a lesser extent um has been really important. Um, I think one thing that people can really leverage is groups. So um, posts that are put into Facebook groups are usually highly uh, localized. Um, now, I do say proceed with caution. Wa- you know, join the group, watch the group, look at how they interact. If it's not overly positive and it's not going to serve you, yeah, it's not worth your time. Because the amount of stress that it's going to give you, like we have, for instance, a couple of local groups in our area that somebody will post something and then just like 60 comments of just like pure visceral anger, like that's not going to help you grow. So, but there are groups So we have, a, we're really f- fortunate to have the Minnesota Direct um, Facebook group and it was a group built to connect farmers with consumers and we've had a lot of success there I would say you know every time I post in there I get like five or six new followers Mm. um you know the next thing is then encouraging them to subscribe to our email list and then once they're in your email list you sort of own that data um Mm -hmm. so that's really sort of like the workflow of things you know um understanding the context of those tools um and how you can leverage them to gain that that community Right. Yep. So. Yeah. Well, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Uh, and more proof that you're the right girl for the job. So uh, look forward to this course. What do you think it is that separates your approach from other approaches that you've seen uh, o- online? And, and how are you uh, trying to kind of uh, niche yourself down to uh, a certain market in, in that you're trying to reach and, and educate? Yeah, so the internet in and of itself is actually, I've come to see it as an ecosystem. Um, in my work on the farm at a regenerative farm, I, I see every day how changing one tiny thing in one area of our farm can have ripple effects across the way or in a totally different species group. And so um, looking at the internet and how interconnected it is, if you can get your website populating better in your local SEO searches, can you get more audience traction on your social media platforms? Or if you start getting your social media really going, will you be recognized by search engines more readily? And then will people be filtered down to your website, which is where you really want them to go? And so it's sort of, it becomes more of an energy flow and a momentum of building relationships, both online and offline and approaching everything from a standpoint of um, it's give and take and everything is connected and understanding how those connections work so that they can work in synchrony instead of fighting each other and, you know, just feeling like 
Um, it's just too much, right? Um, you know, avoiding overwhelm through uh, better management of these tools. I think that one of the one of the things that I have come to understand or uh, think about uh, social media in general is I and the way I talk about it is that it's intentionally broken, <laughs> uh, that it's it's broken so that you will pay them to make it work like you imagined it should have worked when you started. So uh, is that in your in your opinion, uh, an accurate understanding of of social media? Uh, as far as how you get your content on social media in front of the people that you want to see it? Is that is that a too cynical view or is that accurate in your mind? <laughs> yeah, so we actually just did a really huge survey of all of our um, our email subscribers to understand how they're getting to us, where they're finding us, that kind of a thing. And, and I was really surprised to find that 40 per, 47% of all people who subscribe, subscribe to our email list actually found us on social media. Um, something really important to note about social media in and of itself, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter's job, right, is to keep people on their platform mm. as long as possible. They've done amazing amounts of research to figure out how to get people to stay there. And, you know, so if we can understand how, um, you know, with social media in general, if we can create content that does keep them on the Facebook platform, but encourages them to go into their Google and search us, mm. you know, that's how we sort of push those things. So we have started avoiding using links. Um, mm. you, they, uh, Facebook is actually trying really hard right now to compete with YouTube um, mm. by uh, promoting long uh, videos. Um, so if you create content that's like three minutes or longer in a video format, um, that's a lot more likely to be shown to users. Um, Facebook in and of itself. Um, so again, they came under a congressional investigation or they were investigated, right? Um, and so they've changed their algorithm to promote family and friends content over any other type of content. Mm -hmm. So um, talking with your users saying, hey, you know, can you share our content or, you know, encouraging them to interact with it. So um, content that you put out that, um, so let's back up the train. So what happens when you post? When you post to Facebook, what it does is it shows your content to a very select number of people. Those people then will either interact with it by liking, sharing, commenting. Um, they can read more. So that little read more link, clicking on the photo, any type of engagement like that is tracked by Facebook. And it says, yes, people are recognizing this content. They find value in it. And so it will promote it to more users that are like-minded. Um, if you have a lot of engagement within the first one to three hours, um, it will continue to push out to more and more people and actually um, to the friends of people who are watching your page or who are following your page. Um, so creating quality content um, is a lot more about telling your story and driving engagement than it is active selling. And so we have a lot of like quick and dirty recipes that we push um, every Mindful Meat Monday. Um, we have a lot of parents. So having that type of content really drives engagement. Um, they'll share it to their page because they want to save it for later. And like they're not going to use their bookmarks or whatever. Their friends, you know, that kind of thing is really um, what drives people on social and how you can leverage it. Yeah, that's really good. And I, I've seen that myself, uh, you know, through some of the content I've created. Uh, you know, they even have recommendations, you know, about video length and the longer the video, the more likely it is to get shared or or, or whatever pushed out to more feeds and, and different things like that. So uh, really appreciate that. Really appreciate uh, your your kind of boots on the ground perspective as somebody who has <laughs> been uh, kind of uh, figuring this out as they go uh, for their own own business and and for their own uh, business that they are using these tools to 
to reach their end consumer. So uh, I guess we have done an episode together and there'll be a link in the show notes page for that at workingcows.net slash 165. We'll have a link to uh, the episode that, that you and George and I uh, did together talking about Walker Farms and stacking enterprises and some of those things. But could you just give uh, a little bit of a, a brief rundown of what you guys have going on there, uh, kind of from pasture to plate in a sense of, of how you guys are approaching these things and how you guys are using these tools for, uh, for your own business? Yeah, for sure. So um, at Walker Farms, we raise grass-fed beef, grass-finished lamb, pastured pork, pastured poultry, so including meat chickens as well as Thanksgiving turkeys, um, and then uh, the pasture-raised uh, eggs So we have laying hens. Um, now, insofar as how we market those products, a lot of what we're talking about is actually our production cycle and how we how we treat these animals. What is their life like on the day-to-day? What is our life, life like as farmers on the day-to-day? Um, you know, talking about our triumphs and our failures. Um, I think one of the things that really surprised me because of just a, like, a lot of negative connotation prior to becoming a farmer um, was people were scared to tell their story because they might be attacked for being a farmer. And what I have learned is, especially with our customers who are the most phenomenal people in the world, um, <laughs> they actually want to celebrate alongside of us. Um, and, you know, I have a pretty zero tolerance policy for internet harassment. Um, I encourage that. Um, if people, if they, ha- if they have a question, if they have a legitimate question about how we produce, I will openly and honestly answer it within the comments and like, this is what we do. And I may even follow up a couple of days later, a week later, Hey, we had this audience question. This is, you know, what, you know, one of our, one of the questions, for instance, was what do you put in your feed? And so explaining what, you know, what is in the feed, where is it sourced from, where is it mixed from the, like from the ground to your plate? How is, how does that all happen? And what does that look like? And, it's that kind of transparency that really builds customer trust. Um, for um, if we backtrack, so um, to a failure, because I think um, looking at your failures uh, as a producer is really probably the most important thing. And um, one issue that we've run into is uh, we got a new breed of chickens, and they have all synced up, and they all molted at the same exact time when we got snow, and we went from getting like 400 eggs a week to like nothing Mm. and we had a lot of really upset customers and and rightfully so i understand it like it's really frustrating when your your um stream of you know nutrition is all of a sudden interrupted and sort of like especially after this last spring when shortages Mm. were just in mass all over the place um and the way that we handled it was like okay yes this is what's happening. This is a biological process. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. And having that conversation, both on social media, on our website, and also um, through our email marketing, explaining what's happening, um, it was really, really well received. We only got maybe one or two like sarcastic comments, I would say. They weren't even necessarily like negative. Um, it was just, you know, if you can, if you can foster that two-way dialogue and be ex- extremely transparent and explain yourself, um, that's where you're really going to be um, successful. And that's where we found the most success. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. I think it, it kind of just adds some more, some more proof to the, to the fact that you're the right person for this job, uh, as far as, as, as the, as the one to, to go out and equip, uh, producers with the tools to, to do these things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in your mind, who is this Mm -hmm. course that you're developing for? Uh, is it the person who is, is just getting started? Uh, the person who's been doing it for a while, who, who do you have in mind when you're, when you're looking to, uh, market this course? You know, um, I think it's really for everyone. I want to make it for everyone because really, so, I mean, there is no one way to do something. And so if, you know, you're just getting into it, you can look at my stuff. We, you learn that way. Um, I'll help you through things, but, you know, I encourage you to find continuing education um, wherever it may come through, you know, I'm, we are all constantly learning. 
Um, if you've been doing this for a while, or perhaps you feel like you flatlined, or perhaps you don't know, even know where to get started. Like it's, it really, um, there is going to be something in this course for everyone. Um, I even find myself thinking, you know, as I'm building out this course, oh gosh, you know, I haven't thought about that thing. I'm going to add it in and, you know, make sure that um, it's really well-rounded that either if you're just getting started or you've been doing this for five, 10 years, um, it really equips people for success and maybe helps them challenge their thought process, their thought process and how they're approaching their marketing and maybe how they could either streamline it to reduce stress or streamline it so that, um, you know, it's a sl- more slippery slope to the checkout button. <laughs> and you, when you were talking about, uh, you know, your, your experience that's led you to uh, create this course and, and kind of mm-hmm. even, even the importance of sharing your own failures uh, in, in your, in your, in your marketing and your social media presence, being honest and open and transparent uh, with, with the, uh, with the broader pr- public. Um, you mentioned shortages uh, that we all saw, heard, um, heralded on the news uh, through through kind of the the startup of this this pandemic and and how it was impacting the supply chain, especially in protein and but other sectors sectors as well. Uh, so how do you how do you see um, your your course uh, equipping those people to uh, overcome the the kind of broken sh- supply chain uh, that we are all kind of existing in. And, and I guess there's, a, I've, I've received a lot of, a lot of, especially right around that time, I received a lot of emails saying uh, we need to, we need to talk to people who are doing this work. Uh, and I reached out to a few of them and I, I never heard back. And, and then to get your email and, and talking about this course, I thought it was, you know, a, a great solution to that, uh, that market demand for this kind of a product. So how, how are you looking at this as an opportunity uh, where people start to think about uh, their where they're getting their food and the, the farmers and ranchers taking that opportunity to educate themselves and prepare to maybe go about marketing their products a little differently? I'm all about market disruption, especially when it comes to um, sort of destruct or not destructing, but deconstructing the monopolized um, facilities that we see that are for, you know, pigs and chickens and that kind of a thing. And insofar as how we as farmers and how we as ranchers can disrupt that, it's through the use of these types of digital tools and story making and connecting people with their food, um, especially as interests have increased, uh, especially after, you know, having Kiss the Grounds new movie come out, um, you know, Sacred Cow will be coming out. She just released that book. Um, you know, so people are really starting to hunt for new answers because our, our, you know, our population is sick. (laughs) Like people are really, um, you know, they recognize as, you know, depression is increasing, obesity is increasing, diabetes is increasing, all these things. People are starting to look at their food. And so, um, you know, using these tools so that you can kind of cut out the middleman or the 18 middlemen between you and your end consumer, um, really is a great way to build that transparency out, help you understand where you are as a business, and then also help people connect themselves back to their food. Um, I think one of the big things, especially in direct consumer sales, is that we get to capture more of our margin. Mm -hmm. So um, we end up having a larger profit per pound than somebody who's selling into a conventional market or selling to a major processor like a Tyson or a Smithfield. Um, And to me... (laughs) having a farmer make more money on the product that he puts or he or she puts their entire soul into um, is never a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really learning how to equip yourself, the tools, how to use them. You know um, you're not going to use a fork to till your garden. Like, and so how can we use these tools within the context that they are actually constructed for so that you can, again, shorten that supply chain between you and your end consumer. Yeah, and I think Gabe Brown talks about that in his book Dirt to Soil. Uh, that he's 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 greedy. He doesn't want just the eighteen cents that's left over after all the other middlemen take out there. He wants he wants the whole dollar <laughs> to come his direction. Oh, definitely. So I've never been good at sharing. You can ask <laughs> any of my three brothers. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> so Very good. I encourage that type of behavior when it comes to your profit margin. Yeah, absolutely. What are what are some of the financial benefits or how, how are you guys, 
how are you guys doing with this? How, how has it been at Walker Farms uh, for you guys to, to go into this market? What's kind of been uh, the, the timeline that you guys have been working through and how, how has that been going for you guys as far as uh, direct-to-consumer marketing is concerned? Yeah, so um, I would be lying if I said we didn't benefit from COVID. Um, you know, we've had some pretty steady growth uh, in the last five years, um, and we've been really happy with what we were seeing. Um, now, once lockdowns hit in March, um, we sold out of product pretty quickly, and we started rationing things off because we wanted to make sure we could serve our local community um, ahead of those outside of it. And you know how that's looked has really been a couple of things. So we created a VIP list. So people that have been with us through our ugly teenager stage of when we were getting things figured out. And like, you know, we used to have like a email texting system, like, Hey, I want like two whole chickens and whatever. And so we had to manually enter everything into spreadsheets and it was terrible. (laughs) Um, So, you know, getting systems in place, making sure that it was streamlined, making sure that, you know, we could sort of work in our strength areas um, and then like building it out from there. So um, I think the thing right now, we've experienced so much rapid expansion that um, there have been costs that have been incurred with that. And then also there's, um, we had our, our big walk-in freezer kind of um, die. Mm. And that, <laughs> that was, slightly traumatic and very expensive. So these are all the things that sort of cut into your bottom line. So one of the biggest things um, for us has been, you know, making sure that we can have healthy profit margins so that we we can be successful and invest in a brighter future for ourselves, our farm and for our community. A lot of times I think that um, what what's missing is people aren't willing to make that upfront investment in a website. Uh, and they they try to use other platforms, uh, borrow other people's real estate online to to get that uh, to get that done. And I really don't think there's a replacement for having your own your own website. Is do you agree with that? Are you uh, are you encouraging uh, people to have their own platform and drive traffic that direction mm-hmm. through through all of the other other tools that they're using? Definitely. So our website I view as our our employee that never sleeps. <laughs> um, it is constantly there. It is constantly live serving our customers. You know, hey, you need a recipe. Oh, well, you know, I saw you were looking at chicken drummies. Like maybe this would help. Um, you know, it's making sure that you're meeting people where they're at. And I, as a single person, like a single human being, cannot facilitate all of those conversations, um, you know, on a normal day, we're probably getting about 250 unique visitors to our website. Um, there's absolutely no way that through email or phone calls or people showing up that I can serve that many people and still collect eggs and clean the coop and do all the stuff that needs to get done to run a farm. So really and truly your website is your online representation of you and your branding and your mission. And oh, by the way, these are the products that we sell. And so you can invest in our shared vision and values. Um, And, you know, making sure that that website truly represents who you are, um, that's where you're going to grab people. And again, I'm going to say it like, Farmers and ranchers are busy. They do not have time to have all these conversations and be asked the same exact question 250 times a day by 250 new people. So it's really going to streamline those conversations. And like, you know, when we get emails, we can say, hey, check out this blog post. And it just sends in that way rather than typing up the same exact thing every single time. Could you talk a little bit about the format for the course? Uh, what you are, what you guys are are doing? Uh, or what you're doing through the course and how you have it laid out and what, what people will be, uh, what, what is the content that they'll be consuming, uh, through the course? Right. So there's going to be four major sections. Um, so the first one being social media marketing, the second one being websites so web best practices. Um, what does that look like? Branding colors, that kind of thing. Um, we're going to talk about email marketing. What are some best practices there? Uh, and then local search engine optimization. So again, remember, 41% of all searches are made with local intent. So that's really going to be a key part of being successful as a small local business. Um, 
a big overarching part that we're going to be talking about through every single section is going to be analytics. So how do you actually measure success? So um, I, you know, we had a family meeting a couple of years ago and I was like, if we don't, if we do not actually have performance indicators and like goals for these things, we will not know if we're going to be successful. So I'm going to help, you know, people, or I want to help people be able to build dialogue around how they define success. What does that look like? Um, and then how to use those tools. Um, I will also at the very end offer some deep dives on like some of the things that we do here on our farm. So what do I use to take pictures? How do I do that? Different things to edit with, um, you know, and, and talking about like scheduling platforms and, and things like that. So we can get all streamlined. Um, and again, you can schedule it, walk away and do the things that you need to do to actually run your farm or ranch. How much time a week do you, and would you recommend or using, using this course after a person's used, used the, the materials that you're creating through this course uh, and, and they're implementing the tools that you have uh, encouraged them to implement, how much time per week would you uh, estimate that they're going to spend uh, on, you know, scheduling posts and, and creating content uh, so that they're able to, to do the rest of the work that they've got to do throughout the week? <laughs> Yeah. So um, my typical Monday, I spend about two hours working through my content for the week, to, you know, figuring out my plan um, and getting everything formatted and scheduled and, you know, out into the world. Um, every day I do spend maybe 20 minutes just checking posts, responding to comments, making sure that I'm engaging with my community and questions are being answered in a timely fashion. Um, and, you know, insofar as the like actual website curation um for the most part i uh, i usually update my website like maybe once a year i'm i'm kind of lazy about it and it's terrible i know but <laughs> um just making sure that it's built for success so that you can walk away and make sure it's going to continue working the setup is always what is most daunting for people so if you are mm -hmm. starting from scratch um you know it, the setup is going to be a little bit more extensive, but the the day to day or week to week um, grooming of your platforms should be fairly minimal. Uh, yeah. So when you talk about updating your website once a year, that's kind of uh, going through the pages and making sure that all the content's still accurate and relevant. Is that what you're talking about, or what are you what are you talking about yeah. there? Yep. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, unless I've been notified that something is broken on our website. Um, it's looking at my pictures, um, looking at my different um, collections of products. It's usually when I'm starting to work through some of my pricing. If something wasn't selling great last year or even, you know, on a quarterly basis, I'll look at that. Um, I'll look at the page and like, hey, why are chicken drummies not doing well? Um, is it because I have limited copy, no copy, cop or copywriting that doesn't, isn't like attractive? Um, so, you know, having being able to again use those tools to understand where i'm lacking so um i am a google analytics addict um i use it a lot for our website to understand um where like my page drop-offs are so i can look and see okay so where am i losing people why are they leaving my website um if they're leaving at the checkout page or are they leaving at the completion page like what's being you know what's turning them off and so getting that set up and then showing people what charts I use in Google analytics to be able to tell um, where they're being successful and where they're not like that. That to me is key. How do you define success? And then once you've defined it, how do you measure it um, so that you can really start continuing to move forward in that cycle? I'm about to ask a question I don't know the answer to, and I do that a lot, but uh, in this case, it's, it's a little bit more uh, of a risk, I guess. But uh, do you feel like you have a, a good understanding of our food system uh, prior to the centralization that went on over the past, I don't know, 50 or 60 years? I'm, and, and what I mean by that is like, I, and I say this a lot and people probably get sick of hearing me say it. And there's a lot of things like that on this podcast. But one of the things that I do say a lot is we should be eating you know, like our grandparents did a hundred years ago, we should be farming like our grandparents mm -hmm. did a hundred years ago, uh, you know, and, and a lot of those different things. And one of the ways that they ate a hundred years ago was if it didn't come off of their place, it came from a butcher shop or it came from a very local source. Uh, and so mm -hmm. 
when you walked into that butcher shop 50 years ago, was that local meat hanging there in your understanding? Or do you, do you even, do you know that, I guess? Yeah. So um, my grandparents and great grandparents were all agrarians. Um, And so I grew up hearing stories or being involved in it. Um, I vaguely remember being in my grandpa's combine down in in Northern Kansas, Anthony, Kansas. Um, Hmm. And, you know, talking about, you know, the respect for the land. And he talked about what it was like um, during the Dust Bowl. I mean, it was age appropriate. I was like, Five at the time so you know it wasn't like the the really bad stuff you see on pbs but you know it was it was um, very much a relationship and a give and take um and explaining to us as small children that uh, the importance of that um was really key in defining how i see agriculture and and sort of framed up you know sort of i think framed me up for where i'm at now as a direct-to-consumer farmer um I remember my grandma sitting me down. I was like 12 at the time. And she goes, if you have the power to change something, you must change it. You have to be that driver of change or no one else will. And so um, I have very much taken that to heart. Uh, This was the grandmother that I was named after. She was a, she immigrated to the United States um, during World War II. um, And she was incredibly strong. And, um, you know, she she always was really um, talking about food transparency. Or if if your animals have to have a bad day, they should only have one. Mm. Um, you know, and and again, like so, my step family was all very military background. One shot, one kill. Mm. You know, if you must take a life, may it be swift. And so, you know, that type of approach to agriculture, I think, is really important, and where we need to see that change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I do. I think that we've lost a lot of that local connection. Um, and there's so many problems in our culture, I think that could be fixed by, by a more local connection. You know, I mean, uh, we, we tend to hide in our, in our dens, in our living rooms, in our man caves and in our she sheds and, and flip on Fox news or MSNBC or CNN. And, and all they want to do is, is, uh, frighten us. And, and in my opinion, make us hate our neighbor. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think that if we had a, a connection to our neighbor because he was growing our food and we were providing his mm-hmm. fiber or whatever, uh, you know, there would be a lot less, a lot less of those issues that we're, that we're currently dealing with. So uh, I appreciate that perspective. Yeah. Um, what are some, what are the first steps? Like somebody wants to get started. They want to, they want to take your course. Uh, should they rip the bandaid off and start selling individual cuts of meat or is it holes and halves and quarters or, or how, how are you, how do you think about those things? First things first, I am creating an ebook that I will provide um, you with a link to for this page so that people can kind of get started. Like you know, top three things that you can do um, to start implementing some of these things right away. So um, then, you know, if you're not selling, then, you know, I would suggest getting into into the course so that you can understand some of the workflows. So um, how we use, so we actually use Gracecart for our website um, and how we set it up. And so depending on your availability of butchers, which is a huge thing, um, or your availability to your most local market, that's really going to determine how you set that stuff up. So understanding your business model, like I think that's going to be the biggest key thing. Like, what is my context like? How far do I have to travel to find my customers? Who am I talking to? What needs do they have? How can I meet them where they're at? Um, you know, next, it's going to be actually starting to build out some of these tools. What does that look like? Um, and so that's where that deep dive course comes in of, you know, build your website, get it verified, go, you know, do these other things and like actually set up an action plan. And then how do you, how do you curate those things and, and keep them sort of fed and happy? Right. Um, you know, I see, I see social media as a little bit of a toddler where it, it's attention span or like after time decay, you only have about 45 or 48 hours of like solid view time. And then it just sort of is because of time decay to get degraded, not shown. So, you know, it's talking about those different tools, how do they work? Um, and then the, the different nuances of a couple of different platforms that we use. So. Yeah. I appreciate that. I just looking at the outline, uh, I see a, see a few kind of, uh, comments in there. And, uh, the one, the one is, uh, 
feeding the baby. We're going to, we get to keep on pushing content out to that. And uh, yeah. And I, I think there's been some really good nuggets here uh, that you shared. And I, I really mm-hmm. hope people will uh, take that opportunity to go out and to uh, look up your course. Uh, w- when, when will, when do you anticipate it being available? Uh, what, what's kind of the timeline for the rollout as you are planning right now? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the ebook will be pretty readily available, or it will be available the week that um, Clay drops this, but or you drop this. Mm-hmm. Um, but the actual course itself probably will not get published until February, and the reason for that is we're coming to the end of our season, and I'm, you know, we're we're busy too because we farm. Um, so I need some good, solid, deep winter months to actually like work through all this content, make it make sense, make it accessible, um, and set it up in a way that um, you know people can easily digest it. Um, you know, my, my plan is that there will be a separate price for each section. So if you really feel like you just need to up your web, website game, you're already killing it on social media. Um, you can just get that section or, you know, if you feel like you need the whole kit and caboodle, you can do that too. You know, it just sort of depends on, um, everybody's, again, everybody's context is just a little bit different. And I want to make sure that people feel served and where they need it, um, and supported. That's, a, I think, a hard part. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And yeah. so uh, will the the hub for this, I'm, I'm guessing, will be walkerfarmsmn.com. Is that right? No. Uh, this okay. will be my – I'm building out my own personal website, yeah, annalisawalker.com. Um, it's, it'll be a blog. So um, it'll have the blog, the course, and then I actually have a merch store that um, we're exploring adoption <laughs> to – to grow our family. And so it's uh, a fundraiser for that uh, effort as well. So um, it's really going to be a place where I can talk about the back end of our farm. And um, because our customers, like, again, think about, you know, who are you talking to? Our customers for our farm do not want to hear how I market to them. They won't care about analytics. They're not going to care to see Mm -hmm. the technical side of things, you know, so this is going to be a very separate entity um, from the physical farm, though so the farm will be used as an example, because like, let's be honest, that's where I get all my data from. <laughs> <laughs> that's where yeah. I experiment the most. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. And I, I, I mm-hmm. yeah. So when I was thinking about this, I'm like, yeah, uh, when I, when I let you know that the episode is dropped and I'm, I'm, uh, giving you the link to share, you know, I, I don't anticipate this being something that would get shared on the Walker Farms Facebook page because it's not really relevant to those those individuals. So I think it's really mm-hmm. smart that you're building out uh, your own your own web presence, and mm-hmm. as as would be expected, uh, it looks great. <laughs> uh, AnnaliseWalker.com, and I will have links to that in the show notes page as well at WorkingCows.net slash one sixty five. Uh, are there any major nuggets that we that we missed um, that you would like to to take a little bit more time to look at? You know, um, I think we've really hit a lot of great things that people can work with. Um, you know, in this ebook that we're going to be releasing, there's going to be some really great things that people can work through. So some uh, different worksheets and building out their content buckets and stuff like that. And it's going to be a really great starting point. So uh, you know, without overwhelming people. I think I think we've gotten a really good start. Yeah, yeah. good. Well, and I, I look forward to ha- having you back uh, as the course moves along. And uh, and I guess kind of what we talked about, it will be uh, kind of an a la carte. There will be options to to take part in just one one section or or to buy the whole thing. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. So there will be um, smaller sections addressing each part of the ecosystem, and then one sort of like blueprint right class that sort of cover, you'll have access to all the tools or all the different modules will there be will there be kind of options for one-on-one coaching and and di- different things like that or is that something that you're you're interested in open to considering yeah it's definitely something that i'm interested in open to considering um i have not built that part out yet cuz i really want to make sure that i can get people up and running on something that's self-driven um but definitely something to explore. Um, and as I, you know, get more people in it and start to hear their needs, um, which I think is the biggest part of like, if your needs are not getting addressed, then like they need to be addressed. Um, so uh, working through that with some of these inaugural, uh, you know, customers and students and, and sort of start heading in a, in a direction that 
serves both you and your community. Well, Annalisa, I really appreciate your time today. And uh, we will have links to all that at the show notes page, workingcows.net slash 165. The ebook will be there. AnnalisaWalker.com will be there. Uh, and anything else that you, you think is relevant, we'll, we'll make sure to put it up there. Uh, but thanks for your time today. Yep. Thanks, Clay. Well, good stuff there. And uh, really continuing to enjoy the conversations that I'm able to have here. So uh, thanks for all the support and all the feedback and uh, look forward to continuing uh, to release content here at the Working Cows podcast. Uh, Not sure what we're going to do next week, but we will be back with another episode of the Working Cows podcast next week. We'll see you then. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.